Venice was the wealthiest city in Italy for much of the 15th century. Because of its status as a center for international trade, it was also an important boat building center. It was a republic, but one ruled by a patrician oligarchy. At the head of the republic was the doge, the Venetian name for a duke, who was elected by the other patricians. Before 1400, Venetian art was heavily influenced by Byzantine art. Many icons came to Venice as part of the trading relationship between Constantinople and the Venetian Republic. In the first half of the 15th century, the international Gothic style prevailed that we have seen from elsewhere in Italy. It is only from about 1440 onward that the aspects of the Renaissance art that we have seen already developed in, say, Florence and elsewhere in Tuscany became apparent. And the Renaissance style really firmly took hold in Venice from about 1460 onward. An important variant on the Florentine Renaissance would emerge here in the Venetian Republic in the last quarter of the 15th century, one that emphasized color and light and their fusion. One of the most important 15th century artists to work in Venice was Andrea Mantegna, whose dates were from about 1430 to 1506. He was raised and trained in Padua, which was ruled by Venice at this point. As the home of a university from the 13th century, Padua was an important center for the revival of classical learning, the literature of classical antiquity. Perhaps more than than any other 15th century painter, Montaigne became fascinated with the art and culture of classical antiquity. He worked in Venice in the 1450s and married into the Bellini family, uh, which was the dominant artistic family in Venice in the second half of the 15th century. The Agony in the Garden is usually dated around 1460, when he went to work as a court painter for the ruling Gonzaga family in the town of Mantua. The story of the Agony in the Garden takes place after the Last Supper of Christ, when he went off to the Mount of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, accompanied by some of his disciples. While in despair, he asks God to escape his fate, Father, take this cup from me, he then indicates his willingness to accept fate, yet not my will, but yours be done. His disciples have fallen asleep, proving their human frailty, which is a constant theme in the story of Christ's passion. The episode concludes with the arrival of Roman soldiers and Christ's follower, Judas, who reveals Jesus' identity with a kiss. Montaigne represents the Mount of Olives as a nearly barren outcropping of striated rock. And throughout his career, Montaigne would prove to be fascinated by rock forms, particularly unusual looking ones. Jesus prays in the foreground kneeling and the night is nearly over. We sense sun rays through the lines of real gold on Jesus' cloak and the sky is also lightning at the horizon. In the middle ground, we can see Judas and the soldiers marching towards Jesus. Above and behind them is the city of Jerusalem. Montaigne depicted Jerusalem as a Roman town in terms of its architecture, knowing that it was indeed ruled by Rome in Jesus' era. One tower there is topped with a decoration of a crescent moon, a symbol of Islam. In the 15th century, Jerusalem was ruled by the Islamic Mamluk Sultanate. One significant detail from the biblical story has been changed here. In the Bible, one angel comes to comfort Jesus in his moment of weakness. Here instead, Montaigne depicted a group of five infant angels based on classical sculptures of heroic infants, such as the baby Hercules, and they hold out the instruments of his passion, including the flail, column, spear, and cross. This emphasizes what will be Christ's ultimate strength in accepting his fate. Like many Florentine artists, Montaigne was highly proficient at foreshortening. Note the pose of the sleeping apostle to the right who helps to lead us visually into the scene. The composition is carefully balanced. Note the strong diagonal line that runs from the angels in the upper left down to the nearly dead tree at the bottom right. 
This diagonal separates Jesus and his disciples from the Roman soldiers and Judas and helps the viewer to read the story with the appropriate emphasis and also in chronological sequence. The Agony in the Garden is a tempera painting and it displays the carefully detailed, meticulous, but often hard-edged painting style of Montaigne. Note though the beautiful light colors that he achieved with tempera in the robes of the disciples. The National Gallery is a fine group of seven paintings by Mantegna. One of the most beautiful among them is The Virgin and Child with Saints, dating from much later in his career, from about 1490 to 1505. It is painted with tempera paint, but on canvas, not on a wooden panel. The choice of canvas would allow the painting to be more easily transported. It very much looks as if it could have been an altarpiece, but we have no idea if it was for what church it was intended or whether it was even a personal altarpiece. We see here a theme now familiar to us, the virgin and child with saints. They are all united in the same space as in Memling's Dun Triptych, but they are still arranged hierarchically. The saints stand beside the enthroned virgin and child, but the place of honor on the virgin's right is given to John the Baptist, while Mary Magdalene stands to her left. And John the Baptist slightly outranks Mary Magdalene since he is a relative of Jesus. Mary looks down pensively while she holds up her infant son, who stands erect on her lap and offers a gesture of blessing. He too recalls the heroic infant type from classical antiquity, just as we saw with those angels in the agony in the garden. Now we need to remember that the function of an altarpiece was to stress visually the sacrifice of Jesus as represented in the reenactment of the Last Supper through the blessing of the bread and wine of the Eucharist. Thus Mary and Jesus' gestures are pointed references to the sacrifice. The ointment jar held by Mary Magdalene helps to identify her but is also a reminder of the preparation of the body with oils after death, something she would do for Jesus after his death. The mood of the saints who both gaze upward is likewise restrained, uh, even a bit melancholic. A scroll winds around the cross that is held by John the Baptist. One side of it begins in Latin, the biblical phrase, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. On the other side of the scroll is written, Andreas Montinia C.P.F. The C and P perhaps refer to Montaigne's knighthood. He was proclaimed a comus palatinus, or knight of the palace, by the Holy Roman Emperor in 1469, while the F would be an abbreviation for uh, the Latin fake it, or made this. Montaigne was the first artist to receive such a knighthood uh, during the Rene Renaissance. Montaigne was unusual among 15th century Italian painters for signing his works frequently. We've seen only one other artist so far in this course who did so, and that was Jan van Eyck in Bruges. The foreground is arid, but behind the sacred group stand lemon and pistachio trees. The Virgin and Child were often represented in medieval and Renaissance art in an enclosed garden that symbolized her purity. The Song of Songs from the Old Testament was often read by Christians as prefiguring the Virgin Mary. Here the relevant line reads, A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Montaigne's commitment to finely painted detail is evident here as in his earlier work, and the balance of colors is delicate and lovely. A third painting by Montaigne is intriguing for both its technique and subject. Samson and Delilah is a biblical subject that gained greater visual currency in the 16th and 17th centuries than in earlier eras. The Old Testament Israelite hero Samson was brought low through his association with Delilah, a Philistine woman. In the story told in the book of Judges, Samson can only be conquered if his hair is cut. So Delilah made him sleep upon her knees and then called in men who were waiting to cut his hair and capture him. Montaigne does show Samson on Delilah's knees, but she cuts his hair herself. 
overhanging them as a grapevine. Samson was also meant to avoid drinking wine, but his state of nearly almost unconscious sleep appears to be both drunken and possibly post-coital. Think of the Botticelli Venus and Mars painting and know too how both Samson and Delilah's clothes fall off one shoulder. This small painting could serve as both a representation of a biblical narrative and as a moral warning against indulgence in wine or other activities. But there is another warning here as well. A Latin inscription on the tree trunk reads approximately, a woman when bad is three cents worse than the devil. Montaigne's painting then is an early example of a theme that would become widespread in Europe during the 16th century the power of women. Many paintings and prints would feature strong women, either heroes from the Bible and classical antiquity, or at least as often, villainesses. That there seems to have been a general rise in misogyny in European culture at this time seems clear. Why, however, this should be true is not. Montaigne's technique here is also intriguing. He used a, a different technique from those we've seen before, distemper on linen, which uh, helped him to imitate monochrome sculptures set against a stone background. Distemper painting used the same pigments you would for oil or tempera, but in this case they were mixed with uh, animal size, animal glue, animal-based glue as the medium rather than oil or egg yolk. This is one of several distemper on linen paintings made by Montaigne in the 1490s or around 1500 in monochrome. Uh, the technique here of distemper creates a very matte surface, absolutely no sense of reflection to it. And it would be helpful as a technique to use when you are trying to imitate the look of a sculptural relief. It works very successfully here, especially against that dramatic backdrop of the imitation stone uh, set against. Throughout his career, Montaigne was drawn to sculpture, both contemporary and ancient, and his style typically emphasized the three-dimensional solidity of his painted figures. So it really isn't surprising that he would attempt on his own to imitate the look of sculpture in his painting. Montaigne's brother-in-law, Giovanni Bellini, whose dates were uh, somewhere between 1431 to 36 for his birth date, and who died in 1516, worked in Venice for his entire career. Giovanni's father, Jacopo, had been the dominant painter in Venice around 1440, and his brother, Gentile, would also have a significant career in Venice and elsewhere. By 1470, Giovanni was clearly the most important and most innovative painter in Venice in technique, style, and subject matter. In the course of his very long career, he would train many of the leading painters of the next two generations. So he really played an enormous role in Venice. The National Gallery owns eight paintings by Giovanni Bellini. Uh, they do not have any examples of his large and beautiful altarpieces made for Venetian churches, but they do include a, a, a fairly wide range of other subjects for him. Here we only have time to look at three of the works. One thing to note from the very beginning, Montaigne's art made a profound impression on Bellini, especially in his youth. It would be a valuable use of your time in the National Gallery to compare Bellini's agony in the garden from about 1465 to Montaigne's version of the subject. They usually hang side by side there to facilitate comparisons. So we see the inspiration in the unusual rock formations, uh, Jesus kind of perched up on this outcrop of rock, the lightning of the sky at the horizon, the emphasis on foreshortened figures. But it is also clear that Bellini, partly by the choice of composition being wider, is more interested ultimately in landscape art and in setting the mood through it than was Montaigne. This is just one of many things you could notice in a comparison of these paintings. Bellini's St. Jerome reading in a landscape from about 1480 to 1485 retains Montaigne's influence in the depiction of the rocky desert setting, but his attention to nuances of light is more subtle than Montaigne's tended to be. St. Jerome was the most popular saint uh, depicted in European art 
from the 15th right through the 17th centuries. And the question would be why? Primarily uh, for two reasons. He was considered the patron saint of scholars who often bought pictures of him, but also he was a strong defender of the Virgin Mary's importance in Christianity. His life, both his life in reality and the literally fabulous version of it told in Virogenes' Golden Legend, also lent itself to colorful representations. But who was St. Jerome? He was an important Christian scholar and, for a time, a penitential hermit who lived in the 4th and early 5th centuries A.D. His major contribution to scholarship was to translate uh, the Bible into Latin from Greek and Hebrew versions, providing the version known as the Vulgate, which was used for a thousand years, used into the mid-16th century. When still young, Jerome had spent time in the Syrian desert as one of the early Christian hermits who retired from society to pray and purify themselves. Jerome wrote colorful letters to followers of his detailing how he was tormented by dreams of dancing girls in Rome during his withdrawal from the world. He performed physical acts of penitence in this time, such as beating his chest with a stone to suppress such dreams and visions and to punish himself for having them. And there are, in fact, Renaissance paintings that show him in the very act of penitence. In Bellini's painting, Jerome is shown in the desert, but at a much older age than he was during his actual years as a hermit. Here he peacefully reads a book, but his clothing with his exposed arms resembles that of a penitent. Meanwhile, a lion lies calmly nearby. In the Golden Legend, it was said that a lion stopped by the monastery in Bethlehem, where Jerome resided, and was healed by the saint who plucked a thorn out of the paw of the lion. Ever after that, the lion remained as Jerome's companion and protector. This legend came into accounts of Jerome's life by accident, uh, by migration, in fact. In Latin, the name Jerome is Hieronymus, beginning with an H, and in early compilations of saints' lives, Jerome's life would appear right after that of St. Gerasimus, which began with a G. Now, this 5th century hermit, Gerasimus, had a lion encounter in his tale, and somehow during the medieval period, the lion migrated down into the next story, into St. Jerome's. And since he was a more famous saint and one depicted more frequently, the lion kind of just kept in that story from then onward. Venetian artists came to be renowned for their ability to depict convincing landscapes. Venice's location in northern Italy and role as a trade center meant that the art of this area was often receptive to influences from more northern European centers, always a lot of trade connections between northern Europe and Venice. 15th century Netherlandish artists often showed saints in extensive landscapes, though more often the kind of landscape they would show would look like northern Europe. Bellini was likely influenced by this idea, if not by the specific landscape types. Bellini also began to use oil paints by the mid-1470s. The St. Jerome painting combines both oil and tempera. It is a mixed-media painting. Once more, Netherlandish paintings may have provided inspiration for his turning to oil, but another Italian artist could have played a role in Bellini's use of this medium, too. Antonello di Giovanni di Antonio was often referred to as Antonello da Messina. His dates were about 1430 to 1479. Since he was born in the town of Messina on the island kingdom of Sicily, then ruled by the kingdom of Aragon. Niccolo Antonio Colantonio was said to have been the teacher of Antonello in Naples. The rich court life in the Naples of Alfonso V included the presence of Netherlandish artists who influenced Colantonio and, through him, Antonello. It is debated among scholars whether Antonello had already mastered the Netherlandish painting technique by the time he arrived in Venice, where he is documented from 1474 and 1475, though it is likely he already did know about it.
It is just around this time that Bellini began to use oil paints, first mixed with tempera and then entirely on their own. Antonello's small St. Jerome in his study from about 1475 is a superb example of the subtle master's art. In this case, we have been given the perfect Albertian window, or in this case, door frame, which allows us to look into the saint's study, which is set up as a cubicle within a much larger structure. We're possibly meant to read this structure as a monastery. Here the saint is represented as a cardinal, this church rank did not even exist in Jerome's lifetime, but visually in the Renaissance, he is often shown as a cardinal to uh, suggest the kind of status he held as one of the leading scholars of the early Christian period. The details of light and texture are just as finely done as in any Netherlandish painting of the era, and the illusionistic stone framing of the image reminds us of Bautz's Virgin and Child. Antonello may well have seen a depiction of St. Jerome said to be by Van Eyck that was documented in Naples in 1456. At the same time, Antonello's use of linear perspective in the creation of the floor tiles and the architecture and his profile portrait of the saint are equally strong Italian elements. Jerome's lion wanders at the right, leading our view through a window opening to the out of doors matched by another view of a town on the left. The saint works comfortably, seated at a reading desk with books and writing utensils scattered nearby. In the very foreground outside of uh, the space that Jerome is in, a peacock stands at this stone entrance to the room. Peacocks were symbols of the resurrection. Now, whether directly from the stimulus of Antonello or not, Giovanni Bellini's increasing use of oil paint from the mid-1470s onward allowed him to achieve effects not possible in tempera. Perhaps the best example of such effects is found in his portrait of Doge Leonardo Loredan from about 1501 to 1504. This is a painting in superb condition and shows Bellini at the height of his powers. Portraiture had not been as popular a subject in Venice as it was in Florence until the time of Bellini, and it really was probably through his skill at this subject that a market was created for it. Now, Loredan was elected Doge in 1501. That's one reason we have the beginning date for uh, attributing when this painting was done. Venetian tradition called for a formal portrait to be made of each Doge in state robes. It is likely that Bellini's painting was commissioned then or shortly thereafter. Loredan is shown wearing the corno ducale. This is this very tall cap, which is worn over a thin linen cap. He also has on a white damask cloak, richly embroidered in gold and silver. This particular cloak was worn by the Doge for the procession of St. Mark on February 1st of each year. St. Mark was the patron saint of the city. Bellini uses the background here to heighten the sense of the physical presence of the doge. It isn't completely even in tone. Blue throughout, it lightens as you move from top to bottom and closer into the figure of the doge. And it's a very subtle variation in tone, but helps the figure to emerge from a background. Profile views had dominated ducal portraits in Venice before this, but Bellini characteristically preferred a three-quarter, or in this case, almost frontal view for his portraits. As Netherlandish portraitists did at this time, Bellini emphasized the catch lights in the Doge's eyes to add a greater sense of life to them. Bellini's name is included on a painted piece of paper attached to the stone parapet in front of the Doge as a final piece of illusionism. The fine state of preservation of this work lets us see how Bellini used the possibility of layering oil paint to create a sense of texture. Tempera painters had to rely on external means to create texture. Punch marks, incorporation, uh, patterned silver leaf, the kinds of things we've seen used already. But with oil paint, you can imitate them. So the gold threads here were not painted with real gold, but are being painted illusionistically with oil paint, taking advantage of the reflective properties of that medium. We are convinced of the truth of this portrait in a way that reminds us of Van Eyck's presumed self-portrait.
Laura Don is clearly a man of dignity and is a figurehead, but also a real individual. The sharp lighting which contrasts the two sides of his face so deeply adds to the sense of human complexity here. Seemingly so simple, this is, I think, portraiture at its very best. Bellini's Madonna of the Meadow is unfortunately not in good condition, but I will break my rule here and include it because it represents an important part of Bellini's career, his depiction of the virgin and child set against a landscape. This was a major theme in his art from the 1460s onward. These were very popular paintings in Venice. And he created prototypes and really set the standard for other Venetian artists for one or two generations afterward with this subject. The Madonna of the Meadow is a later example of the subject by Bellini from about 1500. And one innovation he introduces here is to take what we call appropriately a landscape format before most of his depictions of the virgin child were done vertically. Mary holds her hands in prayer while the Christ child sleeps on her lap. This, for contemporary Italians, would bring resonances of another subject, the Pietà, which is the representation of the adult dead Christ on the lap of his mother. And once more, therefore, we see a prefiguration of his death, even shown with the infant Christ. The landscape here resembles the Venetian territories on the Italian mainland and is filled with wonderful details. You have uh, shepherds, cattle, a crane who is fighting with a snake, a little village, puffy little clouds in the sky. And here, the change of lighting in the sky is really compelling. It is fair to say that at this point, by 1500, a virgin and child image by Bellini was appreciated as an aesthetic object. But it is important to realize that it wasn't just an aesthetic object. These people were still using these paintings as devotional works. These aren't mutually exclusive to appreciate the artistry, but to also use them to stimulate devotion. Our last painting for this lecture also spans the beginning of the 16th century, and that is Cima de Canaliano's Incredulity of St. Thomas, completed in 1504. Giovanni Battista Cima, whose dates were circa 1459 or 60 to 1517 or 18, was from the town of Conegliano in the Veneto, that is the Venetian mainland territory. Cima worked in Vicenza before arriving in Venice around 1490, where he achieved success as a painter of religious scenes, both in altarpieces and in private devotional paintings. He was heavily influenced by the art of Giovanni Bellini. As a glance at the depictions by Cima of, say, the Virgin and Child and of the penitent St. Jerome that are in the National Gallery will reveal. This painting, The Incredulity of St. Thomas, is an impressively scaled altarpiece and it is dramatically cited in the National Gallery. It can be seen at a distance as one walks across the pedestrian bridge from the older section of the National Gallery into the Sainsbury Wing. Artistically, too, it represents the transition between the Sainsbury Wing's paintings chronologically from the 13th century up to the 16th century, and then you move from there to the other 16th century paintings in Italy in the collection. Now, the painting was commissioned in 1497 by the Scuola di San Tommaso dei Bututti of the Church of San Francesco in Porto Gruaro, a town in the Veneto. The scuola, remember, is a term used in Venetian dialect to refer to a lay religious group or confraternity that performed good works. The scuola's patron saint was St. Thomas, hence the choice of the subject. Jesus, here depicted as an elegant, idealized, semi-nude figure, stands at the center of the painting with his disciples grouped around him in a semicircle. His height, as well as his supernatural pallor, distinguish him here, easy to pick him out for those reasons, along with his pose and his position of honor at the very center. The room they stand in is large and constructed with attention to the dictates of linear perspective. By now, there really are certain givens about how you design a painting around 1500. Views to the outside world are visible through two windows in the rear of the room. Thomas, at the left, dressed in a striking combination of red and green, which draws our eye to him, energetically steps forward to place his finger in the wound in Christ's torso. 
The Gospel of John tells us that Thomas had been missing when the resurrected Christ had appeared earlier to his disciples, leaving Thomas to state that he would not believe what they related unless he himself could thrust my hand into his side, the side of Christ. This very moment, then, is the moment chosen by Chima to be painted. Despite the impressive figures and large scale of the painting, the mood is really more subdued than dramatic. Chima's art was quite beautiful, but typically restrained in both expression and movement. Thus, Christ looks at Thomas with more wistfulness than forcefulness. The painting, as it now looks, is also a triumph of the art of the conservator. It had suffered damage at several points in its lifetime, including a flood in 19th century Venice. By the 1950s, the surface varnish had darkened considerably, while parts of the paint layers were flaking off. The wooden support was so rotted away that it had to be replaced, and the painting transferred to a new surface. This is a very delicate, time-consuming job with any painting, much less one this large, and requires first putting on the front of the painting paper and fabric to face it, protect it, and then separating off the paint and ground layers from the wood support itself. In this case, the ground and paint layers were then consolidated, and the entire painting was backed by a sheet of linen, then attached to a synthetic panel. Afterward, the painting could be turned over once more, and the blistering and flaking paint finally treated and adhered to the surface. The last step here would be to in-paint, that is, to add paint unobtrusively into those areas where it had flaked off permanently. This way you create the impression of an undisturbed hole. It is now the practice of all museum conservators to in-paint in such a way that their work is entirely reversible if the painting requires for future conservation and attention. The time from start to finish for this project? 15 years. Now, in the National Gallery, if you turn with your back to the Chima painting and walk straight ahead, you will enter the galleries for 16th century art. If we think back to what we have seen in the Sainsbury Wing, a 14th and 15th century painting, the changes in style and the expansion of subject matter have been extraordinary. So we look forward to see what happens in the 16th century. There we will start with three famed painters of the Italian High Renaissance, Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Raphael.